Welcome back to the channel everyone, thanks for tuning in. Today I want to do something a little different and look at the most recent chapter of One Piece, chapter 1085, the death of Nefertari Cobra. And boy, what a chapter it was. Oda's been on a streak of fire chapters these past couple of months and the world building has just been insane. Fair warned, this is your spoiler warning. First, let's talk about the cover page, which was Q. It was titled, Frankie Encouraging Hatchling Turtles on Their Way to Sea. Frankie in this took care of the predator that would have stopped them going out to sea, and is seen holding a sign pointing towards the sea to help them out. This is something I can definitely see Frankie doing, and what made it more special is Frankie was crying those manly tears while holding the sign. What a guy. You go, Frankie. We can't talk about chapter 1085 without first going back to chapter 1084. In the previous chapter, Sabo was recalling his time at the reverie with Dragon and Ivankov. In it, he witnesses Cobra having an audience with the five elders and confronting them on what D is and what it means. In turn, revealing that he has a letter that's been passed down from Nefertari Lili, the first ruler of Arabasta and the only celestial dragon that decided not to live on the red line with the other celestial dragons. Cobra also reveals in the last chapter that there are only 19 weapons and not 20 in front of the empty throne, and that the 20th sword was never placed there, and that that sword belonged to Lily, and that Lily never made it back to Arabasta after the 20 kingdoms pledged their allegiance 800 years ago. Then, the big reveal happened. Emu took the seat of the empty throne and uttered the words, Lily, ending the chapter on a cliffhanger and giving us, the fans, a long wait to see what happens next. I was actually scared that we would jump back to Egghead and that the story would elude us for another few months, if not years. Luckily, Oda in his wisdom and glory decided to continue the confrontation in chapter 1085. Now, before this chapter dropped, I had a lot of theories swirling around in my head, like Emu being Lily, and that Lily underwent the immortality surgery through the Oppa Oppa no Mi, and that somehow they implanted the will of Emu into Lily, creating the Emu that we know of today. Or another theory that I had was Roxy Quebec was kidnapped after the God Valley incident and placed into the God Knights, which, by the way, we still know nothing about. The God Knights were introduced in an earlier chapter and it was the first we've ever heard of it. Personally, I think Shanks has a twin brother and that he is part of the God Knights. And when we saw Shanks, I say that loosely, talk to the five elders about a certain pirate, it was the twin within the God Knights talking about Shanks the pirate. Anyway, I digress. I was talking about Rox. I think he was taken into the God Knights with the empty promise that if he is able to kill Emu, he can take her place as the king of the world. And given that that was Rox's dream, he took her up on it. And I thought that Rox was that figure that was with Emu when we first met her in the flower garden where Rox was given the spot of a personal guard. But this chapter proved me wrong in so many ways. I don't think those theories can hold water any longer. The very first panel is Cobra being in shock as he notices someone sitting in the empty throne. By definition, no one should be sitting there. He asks who is sitting on the throne, and when he hears her name, he realizes he has heard the name before. Turns out, Emu was the name of one of the original 20 rulers. Read into that what you will. Oda certainly didn't give us any answers. In the chapter, Emu confirms that the D is the ancient enemy, and it has been popping up more and more frequently recently. This could be why she had ripped up versions of Luffy and Blackbeard's wanted poster when we first met her, Monkey D. Luffy and Marshall D. Teach. She also had a picture of Shirahoshi and Vivi, more on Vivi later on, and boy is it a doozy. All the other Ds that we know of are either a secret, 
and the world government doesn't know about them? Here's looking at you, Trafalgar D. Water Law. Or they think they have eradicated their bloodline? That's a nod over to you, Jaguar D. Soul. All, all the while, the fate of Rocks D. Quebec is up in the air. But given these new revelations, he is likely either dead or presumed dead by the world government. When Emu finished with the photos, she went down to look at the giant straw hat that they have locked away. This could symbolise the fact that the straw hat is a symbol of the ancient enemy. Emir also states that Lily never made it back as she made a major blunder. And she is the reason the Poneglyphs were scattered around the world and is causing the world government issues now as pirates are finding them and using the knowledge within them. And when Emir is talking about these Poneglyphs or relics as she calls them, she seems angry. But given the situation, Emu then forces some information out of Cobra because she is now questioning if it was a mistake to begin with, giving us a huge reveal. Lily's full and true name is... Now, this is huge, so secondary spoiler warning. So click away now to avoid. Or keep watching. We all know if you are watching this video and you've made it this far, you're a One Piece nerd and die hard like me, or you've already read the chapter so it's not really a spoiler. Anyway, enjoy the reveal. Her full and true name is Queen Nefertari D. Lily. This means the Nefertari family, Vivi included, has been part of the D clan all along. And Cobra knew about it all the way back in Alabasta, but didn't tell anyone. That's crazy. But what it also shows is that there was a D clan member within the founding royals 800 years ago and that very clan sabotaged the victory that was earned. Earned? Stolen? Cheated? Either way, the royals won and formed the world government 800 years ago, but someone was there to see to it that sometime in the future, someone would be able to free the world government of their reign, kind of like with what happened in Wano. Now, we never get to know what is written in this letter that's passed down through the Nefertari royal line. And to make it worse, we don't know if Vivi has even read the letter. The secret may have died with Cobra. Oh yeah, after this reveal, the five elders are not letting Cobra leave. And this is where the rumour that Sabo killed Cobra comes into it. Sabo was there and witnessed this entire thing. Which makes sense if we go back a few chapters. After all... This is Sabo telling the story to Dragon and Ivankov, but this is where the chapter blows us away yet again. Oda is doing a huge fake out with these panels. He is showing the five elders getting different weapons ready. Most are getting pistols out. The swordsman is readying his sword. Then Sabo swoops in to try and save Cobra, coating the room in flames and creating shadowy silhouettes of the five elders. Well, they have to be the five elders, right? But now, we see them, and they're different silhouettes. They're definitely not human shaped like they were a few panels ago. Look at it. These things are either Zoan or a completely different race altogether. This kind of breaks One Piece again for what? The umpteenth time these last few months? What are they? Are they immortal like Emu? Is this a new form they can take? Is Emu the same as them, but the inverse? where we only see the shadow form and never the human form? Or, bear with me, have we seen the human form of Emu somewhere in the story before and are now only seeing her shadow form? Like the Elders, again, but inverse. On my own personal theory, the five Elders are named after planets. We know this could be true as one of them was name dropped and his name was Saturn. Emu is Earth or Sea, because Emu backwards is Umi, and Umi is ocean in Japanese. And what are the ancient weapons named after? Pluton, Poseidon, and Uranus. Now, these may not seem like planet names, but our solar system planets were named after different gods. Pluton is Pluto, Uranus is self-explanatory, it's Uranus, and Poseidon is closely related to Neptune, a planet in our solar system. So hear me out. 
The five elders and emu are also ancient weapons, and the world government had six of them. Six. Compared to the three we know of that the D-Clan may have had. It's easy to see how and why the world government won 800 years ago. But this time, this time, the D-Clan has Nika. Nika, the sun god. If we're going down the road of each ancient weapon being named after a planet, then surely a sun. The literal center of our solar system and the giver of life will provide us with the advantage this time around. Or a second theory that came to my head whilst I was eating dinner the other day. The ancient weapon Emu and the five elders make up nine different entities, just for lack of a better word. Keep this number in mind. Now think back, all the way back to the end of Thriller Bark, where we see three silhouettes in the background as Lola is telling her tale. What if those are rogue entities and they are trapped in the Floridian Triangle? Because during the Void Century, the D-Clan did have six ancient weapons, just like the world government. What if the ancient weapons are also based off of the Zodiac, and there are 12 of them, each doing something different, but equally as powerful? And the only way the world government won was because there was a traitor in the D-Clan that locked up these three in the Floridian Triangle. We know how Oda likes to make mirrors of things, so if the royals had a traitor in the Nefertari family, so should the D-Clan. Maybe the Teach family? Anyway, these were the different things running through my head since the chapter dropped. The rest of the chapter explains in-world activities like how Walpole and Vivi ended up together, and why Morgans is protecting them. Walpole is likely using this information that he learned because he also witnessed all of this as a way for Morgans to help protect him. And Vivi is a princess, so she would have information from the reverie. Each of them holds value to a man like Morgans, so it makes sense that he would want to protect them as his sources. It also showed us what happened to the rest of CP9, and that they're also part of CP0 now. Good on them. All in all, the chapter was great, and answered some questions, but also brought up a lot more. Also, I wonder when we'll go back to Egghead and see our protagonist again. And what is this Egghead incident that we were introduced to months ago? Does a straw hat die on Egghead? Who is this man marked by flames? What is Shanks doing? Like, what's he doing? How is Law going after what happened? What is happening with Kobe and Garp? Why is Kuzan with Blackbeard? This current arc of One Piece is shaping up to be a modern classic, and is setting up this biggest war, as stated by Oda all those years ago. I can't wait. Thanks for listening to me rant about this amazing story. If you want more deep dives into the world of One Piece, I'm more than happy to make more videos like this one. And if you made it this far, a like and subscribe would not be a grave blunder. Thanks for watching, and catch you guys in the next one.